My name is Lauren Bongiorno. I am from Long Island, New York, and I am a type 1 diabetic. So when I was seven years old, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease. And this is basically when your body attacks itself. It attacks your islet cells, which live in your pancreas, and your islet cells are what produce insulin that regulates your blood sugar levels. Um, and so you can think of it like a seesaw. For, for anybody who doesn't have diabetes, when you eat, your blood sugar goes up and then your body secretes insulin to kind of bring it back down. So if somebody who does have diabetes and their pancreas doesn't uh, work effectively, your blood sugar will keep rising, rising, rising unless you take a shot or unless you have um, an insulin pump to bring it back down to level. For people with diabetes, it's something that's a 24-7 job. There's no days off. You can't just take a, a, a medicine, a, just one shot a day and everything's going to be fine. Uh, there's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of fluctuations, and so it can be challenging for especially people who are diagnosed when they're children because children just want to eat whatever they want, they want to do play with their friends, they want to have their own schedule, and it's very um, not routine. So when I was diagnosed, I was a soccer player when I was younger, I did dance, I kind of ate a very basic Italian diet. And we were, there was never really a lot of focus on nutrition or um, you know anything of that matter. So my mom, when I was younger, she saw so many symptoms that something was wrong. I was so thirsty. I was um, going to the bathroom like 10 times in the middle of the night. I was really, really cranky and I was losing weight like crazy. And so those are very common symptoms of type 1 diabetes. And when I went to the hospital, I remember just being fed sugar-free jello for like seven days straight. I was hooked up to IVs and they were trying to get my blood sugars under control. And basically for the diabetes care, it's very standard in the system that when you have type 1 diabetes, you'll go see a doctor, the endocrinologist, every three months. And at that three month mark, what happens is you get an A1C check. And your A1C is you get your blood drawn and it gives you an average of almost um, the past three months of how you do with your blood sugars. It's like your blood sugar report card. When you're younger, the doctors are okay with it being a little bit on the higher end because you're a kid, you're a child, you're out of routine, it's hard to tell children not to eat this, not to eat that, to exercise, all of these things. Basically, when you go to the doctors, when you're first diagnosed, they basically tell you, you can eat whatever you want, just give yourself a shot for your carbs. Um, you can have McDonald's and fries if you want, just make sure you give yourself insulin. Maybe there's some a little additional things in there like, oh, you know, you don't want to have things like cake and ice cream, but an apple is better. Some things like that. Um, and they do offer nutrition help as well. So they'll say, go see a nutritionist. But I was actually on the phone with my mom earlier and I was asking her, I said, mom, I don't really remember because I was so young. Like, did we see a nutritionist? Did we, you know, uh, did they help you at, in any ways? And she was like, oh, don't get me started. <laughs> I was like, well, what happened? And she said, when I went to the nutritionist, she basically taught me how to count carbs. And I was like, well, what did that entail? And she was like, well, they taught me how to read a label and that was about it. What's so shocking about the system is that type 1 diabetes, there are so many things just in the area of food that can really be affecting your blood sugars. And so for people like myself, who went through years of maybe having a hot, high blood sugar all night long and waking up 20 times and not getting a good night's sleep and then going to take a, a final exam the next morning and be at a disadvantage and all of those things, if I would have known that, okay, when you combine carbs and fat, um, you know, let's say you're having a slice of pizza at dinner time, you have to treat that differently. You can't just say that's 35 carbs because you have the fat involved there from the cheese and that's going to extend the carbohydrate um, effect into the night and you might not peak right when you have it, but you might peak four to six hours later. And so that's just one example, but there are so many different other things and other factors, um, what to eat before a workout, what to eat afterwards. You know, gluten for people who are type one diabetic is very, closely related to celiac, and so a lot of people with type 1 diabetes, even if you don't have celiac, have a slight uh, reaction to an inflammatory state. So that's something that you should take into account too um, in learning how to you know, eat a little bit of gluten-free options um, that are more focused on whole foods and just making you healthier all around. So that was one of the problems. And then there's, of course, the problem of as you become a teenager and your hormones are going a little bit crazy, uh, you you're become more insulin resistant. And so your insulin basically doesn't work as good and you need to use more. But then there's the whole element of insulin is a fat storing hormone. So if you're using a lot of insulin per day, you can easily be putting on weight. And so when I was in college, I never learned these basic things about, you know, really just like deep, 
nutrition um, and understanding how these certain foods work my, for my body and really how to increase your insulin sensitivity and really how to make the insulin work in your favor. Um, because for teen girls especially, it can get really frustrating when, oh, I didn't realize that the more insulin that I used, uh, the, you know, the harder it would be to lose, to lose weight. The struggles that I was having, I have now with the current system that is set up where it's very basic, it's very archaic, it's it's very, they hand you kind of a bunch of sheets that are so outdated and just say, okay, here you go, read them, you know, bolus for carbs, don't worry about what, whatever you eat, it's fine as long as you cover for it. Um, exercise, like sure you want to exercise, but there's no like plan set in place, there's no really strong recommendations. Um, and the best control that I ever had in my life was when I kind of took matters into my own hands. And I said, wow, this is something that should be part of the healthcare system because I'm seeing such great results. And so for me, what things that started to help me the most was um, I started yoga and it wasn't even for those reasons. It was for a completely different reason, but I noticed that uh, it helped extremely with stress and when your body is stressed, your body's producing cortisol and that increases your need for insulin and your blood sugars are going high. And so I realized, oh, hey, yoga reduces your stress. So look, I don't need to use as much insulin and my blood sugars aren't spiking um, this day that I have this huge test or whatever it could have been in college. Um, the yoga also helped a lot with self-acceptance and self-love because for people with type 1 diabetes, it can be very, um, as much as it is a physical um, disease. It can be very hard mentally and emotionally, thinking that you're different from others, just like any other disease. And so I think yoga helped a lot with that, and that's something that isn't talked a lot about, I guess, in the, in the healthcare system, specifically to type 1 diabetes. And then another thing was just learning how to eat better and learning how your blood sugars don't have to be so crazy. Um, if you learn how to really properly pair foods and pair fats and carbs, and especially around your workouts, um, and kind of figure out what works best for your body and learn your own patterns. So the first week that you're diagnosed, they basically give you maybe first month um, a log sheet and they say log your blood sugars and they say log your um, the time that you're eating. Let's say like let's say it's 3 p.m. and you're having you know um, and you're and you're I don't know, 120, and maybe there's a section for a tiny bit of notes, like what you're eating and then what you're giving yourself for insulin. Um, and then past that like week, week and a half, month maybe tops, for the rest of your life that you're living with type one diabetes, nobody really asks you to like log your blood sugars anymore. And what's so crazy to me about that is, for myself, when I started writing down what my blood sugars were, just to kind of get in control a little bit and see what was going on on paper, just a simple act of writing them down extremely improved my type one diabetes management and my blood sugars. And that I think stemmed from yoga and learning how to become more reflective and self-aware. And it kind of spilled over into my lifestyle, not just on the yoga mat. And so when I started writing all these blood sugars down, I was finding patterns. I was like, oh, when I eat this, this is making me, you know, this happen. Or, oh, I had a really stressful day. Or, oh, hey, I had my period this week. Like maybe that's why my blood sugars were so crazy. And I started finding these patterns all by myself. And when I would go back to the doctors in between, you know, the three month, uh, the three month mark, when I went back to the doctors, it was, okay, hi, how was, you know, oh, I see they looked very, like very loosely at, at your, at your insulin usage and maybe just a couple questions and, oh, why were you high on this date? Why were you low on this date? And normally growing up for the past, let's say at this point, like 10 years prior to this, like, I didn't know. I'm like, I don't know why I was high three, three weeks ago or, you know, four months ago on that day. I'm not really sure. And I had data. Right, I had all this data saying, oh, I know exactly what it was and I fixed the problem. And I was kind of fixing everything on my own and every time I would go, my A1C was lower and lower and lower. And I just realized, I think we're taught or we're encouraged to rely on the healthcare system for our only source of support. And I think that, of course, there's room for endocrinologists and even diabetes educators to educate on pumps. And there's room for nutritionists for if somebody needs a strict plan of um, or guidance of how to count carbs or how to you know eat, um, how much protein I need a day or things like that. But really, it's really important that we take it into our own hands because we're with ourselves 24-7. And 
where you sometimes blame the endocrinologist or blame this healthcare system and say, well, my blood sugar is not great because they don't give me any support, or my blood sugar is not great because they didn't tell me exactly the steps that I need to take in between appointments. Well, maybe that's not their job to some degree. In a perfect world, maybe there should be more guidance and there should be more, um, more, more tips and more nutrition knowledge, yes. But at the end of the day, I really believe that we have to be our own advocates because everybody is different and all of our patterns are different and it's not something that can be with a handout and say, okay, just follow this and you're good. Because then we're thinking that, okay, we have all the tools we need and then we get frustrated because why are my blood sugars high? Why are they low? Well, no, no, no. That's our fault for assuming that that one size fits all plan is gonna fit me. I find that a holistic approach, looking at your stress levels, looking at your um, how much you're cooking in, what ingredients you're using, um, how you're how you're just feeling about your self love and and your and your body and your acceptance and exercise, right? And how your relationship with exercise and nutrition is that's important as well. I think all those elements should be um, part of part of type one diabetes management and really should be given when they're first diagnosed and say, hey. You know, there's a lot to this. We might we don't have all the answers, but here's a lot more than we've been giving in the past X amount of years. <laughs> so after I had all this tremendous success with getting my blood sugars really under control towards the end of college, I decided that this was something that I was so passionate about, and this is something that I really wanted to help others with, and I wanted everybody with type 1 diabetes to feel that sense of accomplishment and really that sense of control um, that I was feeling. And so I decided to go to health coaching school and I, I am a diabetic health coach and I would never in my wildest dreams think I would be focusing um, my whole entire career on the diabetic community because growing up I was somebody who was like not even associating with type 1 diabetes or anybody with type 1 diabetes because I didn't want to be different. But now I see it as this is awesome. There's a whole entire community of us and we can help each other and we can lift each other up. Um, and so with my diabetic health coaching, I coach people all around the entire world. I have clients in New Zealand, the UK, California, you know, everywhere. And no matter where they are in location, there's still that very um, similar and grounding problem that they aren't feeling supported and they need help to take back control themselves.